Now, there was there was a certain spirit, which uh, I don't know if it's been dampened, uh, well, certainly in some of the individuals involved, but hopefully not in the uh, youngsters. Yeah. But uh, 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 there's a certain spirit of discovery and uh, of the unknown, uh, exploring the unknown that 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 is just man makes you want to you know wake up in the morning or in the night and jump in the lab and, and, and see you know what will come forth. And, yeah. uh, and this is a good thing. This is a really good thing. What advice would you have for someone? Saying there's someone listening right now, there may be a junior, senior in high school, they're interested in lasers, interested in optics, and particularly they would love to one day be a holographer and create holograms. What advice would you have for them to choose that as a career path? Oh, besides keeping the day job? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I say that with uh, some regret. Um, well, it's interesting. You know, in terms of, of the distribution, first of all, there, there are some uh, sort of meat and potatoes aspects of holography, which I'm sure your listeners are probably aware of, uh, involving uh, holographic non-destructive testing and some uh, engineering applications. And nowadays, the idea of creating holograms that are simply templates for you know creating nanostructures and things like that. These are the worlds in which these uh, uh, these kids are going to be uh, you know uh, graduating into, yeah. um, where the hologram is basically um, a tool for uh, any number of other things rather than, uh, let's say, an art object, per se, or, or a device for advertising. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many more what I call these meat and potatoes applications of lottery, which are um, uh, holograms applied to different engineering challenges or biomedical engineering challenges and things like that where, where you know, we, we have a result at the end of the line that is something other than aesthetic. Some people say that, you know, art in the context of art, you know, some people say that it, it, it has to be absolutely useless to be fine art. Mm -hmm. In other words, have no other purpose to be fine art. And there's a value to that. Well, that's so interesting. Like there's a value to, you know, the, you know to have a, a sacred clown, you know, in the Hopi culture or whatever, you know, the, the idea of having, you know, there's, there's, there's a reason for that sort of aesthetic. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if it's uh, something where you want to uh, for sure absolutely positively make money um, and a living at it, uh, then... Then, then perhaps some of these so-called meat and potato applications are, are... Is Charles Vest still the, the president of, of MIT? I, I don't have a clue. Okay, because at one point he was, and I think we should all be proud of that. He's, of course, a holography he published mm -hmm. uh, holographic interferometry, like the Bible of that, many years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Where there was news. And, uh, well, he was, I believe, uh, instrumental with Steve Benton. And yeah, I was going to say, it's, he's probably been uh, uh, very supportive of the uh, spatial imaging group up there. Oh yeah, and yeah. of course the 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 acquisition of the Museum of Holography's collection. Yes. Uh, uh, really, from the depths and throes of, uh, of, uh, of being dispersed to the four corners. Of, I don't know if you go over that kind of history with one of your holo talks, but <clears throat> but there was a point in which the Museum of Holography's collection was going to be uh, dispersed mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in not a good way, and uh, and Dr. Benton and, and Charles Vest were pivotal and and securing it for the MIT Museum, which your listeners can always go look at yes. when in Boston, which is nice. Yeah. I, I'm just so surprised that in a metropolitan area the size of New York City that there, there's no museum of holography anymore. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm just dumbfounded with that. Well, it, you know, this Considering what a, is there. You a know, greater the curiosity, you know. And I mean, I was on Eastman Kodak's website, mm -hmm. uh, the museum, that is, Eastman House's website, and I've been there in person. It's wonderful. But uh, if you go on the website and you look at the history of photographic systems and you go backward, um, you'll see a camera I was looking at a couple months ago. It's uh, made in 1852. It's the first one I could find. That was 3D, a stereo camera made mm -hmm. of you know, brass and wood and glass and funky, beautiful-looking thing and, and taken 3D pictures back in 1852, if I recall correctly. And so now here we are 150 years precisely later. And you don't go into uh, any, everybody's house and see, oh, there's, you know, a stereogram of the grandkids, you know. I'm not mm -hmm. even talking holograms now. I'm just talking about stereophotography, mm -hmm. a perfectly viable, wonderful imaging mm -hmm. system for 3D that anyone can do with any camera. You don't need a stereo camera. You just take two pictures, as your audience might know, you know, from slightly offset views. And um, uh, so here's a perfectly good three-dimensional imaging system, 150 years old, and yet has not thoroughly permeated, uh, uh, you know, the culture. And so, um, of course, we have, you know, 3D IMAX, and still we have Viewmasters and all that, but I'm talking about something where people enjoy it among themselves and, yes. and shoot their own. So, if we have 150 years that stereography is fully, fully integrated into the average person's home, uh, then, you know, w w what is to say, are we to say about, you know, holography and, and 
when and if that will happen. So, so I scratch my head along with the next guy, figuring, uh, trying to figure out why isn't there a hologram in every home, you know, mm-hmm. and a stereogram in every garage. I mean, it's wonderful. And now, of course, it's uh, cheap. And I read a brilliant article by Andrew Pepper uh, about holography and architecture. And um, uh, uh, I'm sure if you do a search for that, you'll find it on the web. It's a really, really good article. Uh, just a couple of days ago, really, about a week ago. And, uh, and he mentions in it uh, that some of the expectations that were created in the early days uh, caused, uh, <laughs> and this is a terrible paraphrase because he was very eloquent about it, yeah. uh, but uh, it caused a, in the consumer, you know, the general public's mind, you know, this kind of expectation that maybe overshadowed the reality to a point where this is why there's a sort of deflated, oh, well, you know. And, uh, uh, but I remember there were years that went by where we would say to each other, among a lot of first, that, you know, next year, you know, it's going to be the big one, you know, and then next year it's going to be, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this went on for a decade. And here we are with gray hair. Yeah. And um, well, of course, you know, holograms have permeated <clears throat> the uh, environment. Uh, for gosh sakes, I've got, I've seen them as litter uh, these days. I was in a parking lot of a Denny's uh, a couple of years ago, and, and they were just like a little you know, litter, <laughs> and uh, which is sad. But uh, there they are. And um, uh, uh, no, it's it's a period I, I I would call you know the tragification, you know, holography. Well, it's happening big in education, but once again, it's almost like we're using holography as a tool. You know, oh, I'm a, glad a to hear that tool. Frank. You know. I did not know that. Oh, absolutely. Full bond yeah. courses, uh, Very you can graduate as a the doctor in holography? Oh, no, not to that point. We're oh. talking about uh, uh, supplementary uh, classroom activities in science and physics and things of that nature. To the elementary or mainly high school? Uh, mainly high school, yeah. Good. I've seen a lot of science fairs with it, you know, uh-huh. and uh, some of the projects that I've been involved with with disadvantaged youth seems to be uh, taking off, too. Right oh, that's right. wonderful. Yeah. That and is Florida. really good. Duval County in Florida. Actually, I'll be down in Florida in November. You're kidding? Yeah. To, oh, we uh, got to get together. Yeah, I don't know how far Duval. Uh, it's in Jacksonville. I don't know how far that oh, it's is. It's got to be closer right. than where you are now. Well, absolutely, it's closer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a buzz uh, before I head down for that. So you're going to make holograms with the kids? Uh, meeting with a few of the community colleges and oh. the Duval County School District. I was down there uh, one time before. There's a, a teacher down there that is involved with communication technology, and he has a wonderful holography program for Oh, uh, this is great. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, so uh, that's starting to be mirrored in other areas as well. Yeah. If I can help, just let me know. That Absolutely. Yeah, uh, in fact, I will let him know, you know, that you're so close close by. I, I really enjoy yeah. that. In fact, more than anything, I I, I, uh, I learned so much when I started teaching that I never expected to learn so much uh, when I started teaching. <laughs> I yeah, that's that's most actually of what I did for many years, uh-huh. you know, through museums and, you know, science museums and stuff. Put food on the table, you know. Hmm? But this isn't my interview. This is yours. <laughs> so okay, go ahead. Let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's get back to, uh, I, I know you had mentioned earlier that uh, you had sent an email, you know, listing a few of the things that you want to cover. I did go right. back into the email program. I didn't see that. So if there's anything. Well, you didn't. I worked hard on that, Frank. I know. You probably <laughs> did. No, actually, there's nothing there unless it's something that I didn't click on uh, or whatever. But uh, as, as of 2.30, I wasn't able to find it. And, oh, I uh, see here. It has an odd uh, title. I'm looking at it now. What does it say? It doesn't uh, say anything about how thing. I can enlarge my breasts or anything, does it? No, no. Because I get a lot of no. those. Okay, I can look at it and use it as a, as a reference yeah. here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, for the students out there who are starting to make holograms, uh, I make a note of the importance of uh, optical schematics and triple checking yourself. The idea that whatever you're doing, make yourself a little sketch. It doesn't have to be elaborate, uh, whether you're using continuous wave, ENEs, or, mm-hmm. or diodes, or whatever. Uh, make a little sketch of what you're doing. Uh, Make your measurements, you know, a little tape measure, centimeter measure, like a tailor's measure, and, and uh, take some notes because you'll find from time to time you'll uh, you'll do something really neat and you'll want to repeat that experiment. Mm-hmm. So no matter how simple they are, uh, some kind of optical schematic of what you've done. And as far as triple checking yourself, well, it's just a good way to save uh, save on materials. Yeah, measure you, uh, measure twice, cut once. Yeah, well, I like to measure three times yeah. because then you can go two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was something I wanted to, to bring out. Um, and, uh, uh, well, um, take your time. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, you cut out the blank spaces? Uh, no, we're all right. I mean, you know. Well, it's interesting. Um, I've got uh, uh, one of the reasons for some of these somewhat, you know, sort of campy or kitschy or sort of silly things that I've done, uh, like the, you know, the smelling hologram and stuff, uh, and the macaroni piece, I guess people know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's just that we take ourselves so darn seriously, um, so it's important to, to lighten up. Yeah. And uh, and so that's why I like doing sometimes, uh, you know, somewhat silly things in holograms because it's just all so darn serious. Uh, by the time, you know, you split your beams and you get all your other stuff right and you pay the rent and everything, bam, uh, you know, it's hard to uh, to uh, to add some levity to the situation. Yeah. So every like every hologram doesn't have to uh, describe the meaning of life. No, but if you, you can send me a copy of that particular one, I'd like to see that. <laughs> Got it. It seems like a lot of them try. Interesting. Yeah, I, I love to read some of the descriptions, of, not just with holography, but anything in art, you know, as far as what the artist was trying to convey. Right. And uh, I get lost sometimes, to tell you the truth. I just get up in the morning and do a day's worth of work, that type of person, you know. So yes. I'll read these descriptions. And well, can, it, it's funny you said it, because actually I did make a note that perhaps the, uh, perhaps the, uh, the ultimate impact of, uh, of holography will be you know, the so-called holographic paradigm, the, the idea that, you know, from, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know how to disable that. Should I answer that, Frank? Uh, that may be the big contract. Why don't you answer it and get back to me? I'll put this on. Funny uh, guy. Hold on. <laughs> hey, hello. Hello. Hey, okay, we're, we're, we're eating up megabytes, aren't we? That's okay. Are we going straight to the hard drive, or are you going to actual tape, or what do you I go, I go right to the hard drive. I also Pass have me. an optical recorder, too. But and I we're rolling now? Yes, we are. Oh, I apologize. Well, that's okay. For what? Uh, well, eating up gigs, I don't know. This so is, what this I was is saying an, is, um, is I'm sort of not disabling the uh, call waiting, I suppose you call it. Okay. What I started to say was that um, it, it, it took me a while to figure this out, but perhaps the ultimate impact of holography uh, will be completely invisible and weightless. Mm -hmm. Have mm -hmm. nothing to do with making holograms yes. that tell you whether uh, uh, welds are separating or, or selling uh, toothpaste or, uh, uh, you know, pop musicians and all that good stuff, um, mainly uh, just the principle of holography as applied to our understanding how information is dispersed through the universe. This is a, a paradigm that's been kicked around for quite a while, and there are whole books on it, as I'm sure some of your audience is aware of. Uh, but it took me a while to figure out that that was really important stuff mm -hmm. versus uh, all the actual hard applications of holography. Uh, you know, hard copy applications where you're actually making something. Mm -hmm. but the concept is, uh, is maybe more more lasting and more powerful than anything we can actually do with the medium. Mm. So uh, uh, this is interesting. This is a very interesting aspect. That, again, as I said, it's weightless and invisible, but very much real. Yeah. Yes, very much. Very much. In the old days, you know, when I was first making holograms, I felt that I was at ground zero and that all these people, you know, and with robes and incense and everything, they were, they were talking about this <laughs> stuff back in the mid-70s, it seemed like, you know, well, what the heck did they know about holograms? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, because they were adopting the hologram as their, uh, you know, their paradigm for yeah, explaining yeah. different various things. But then in time, after I did a little research and I met a few individuals, I, I started, uh, who were on the subject, um, I, I started realizing that this is really powerful stuff. And, yeah. and it's way, way uh, important. Yeah, you, back back with uh, Carl Pribram and... Uh, oh, yeah. I spoke, uh, I've spoken with him. Yeah, yeah and uh, David Bohm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think Ken Wilber did a wonderful book on that. I think it's called the Holographic Paradigm and Other Paradoxes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they're very, they're very interesting. And of course, for ancient, for those in the audience who are unfamiliar with what we're talking about, because that's possible. Yeah. Um, uh, there, uh, the idea that you take a hologram, break it into little pieces, and see the entire scenario in every little piece because of the dispersed information storage aspect of holography, that you can actually break a hologram piece off and see the whole scene that was pictured in, uh, you know, Frank, sometimes you and I forget about stuff that people are unaware of that yeah, yeah. when they're first coming to this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, in any event, it's one of the most powerful aspects of, uh, of, of how different holography is from photography, the fact that you can break off a little piece of a hologram and see the whole scene pictured in that little piece and mm -hmm. uh, because the hologram is like a window into that scenario and, uh, so this has led to corollaries with um, these ancient Eastern philosophical tenets that uh, that suggest that uh, that information about everything is everywhere and transcends space and time. And mm -hmm. You simply have to get in the right mindset, 
to access that information, but it nonetheless fills all space and time. So it's very interesting uh, having a, a hard copy version of example. Yeah. Well, I, I think used to call point toable example. Uh, one of the, that phenomenon. the famous quotes for that is the brain is a hologram interpreting a holographic universe, I believe. Is, That's uh, a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Well, it would make sense that if you were going to build an antenna for something, that it would have to uh, correspond uh, to the waveform that mm -hmm. you're trying to receive. Yes, exactly. Good yeah. thinking. Yeah. Sharp. Um, totally unrelated, but may not be. Okay. And I've always wanted to ask this. You, you do so much commercial work. And I have to phrase this properly for this show, but uh, do, you, do you ever get a lot of calls for any adult work? You know, considering um, the, the explosion of adult material on the Internet, sure, and it's, it's mostly it's, visual. Uh, yeah, the two main reasons for trees dying uh, in the world, or being cut down uh, for paper, are uh, uh, pornography and uh, computer manuals. <laughs> Those are the two biggest eaters of paper, yeah. uh, of trees right now on Earth. But seriously, folks, um, uh, well, once in a while, let's call them erotic, you know. Yes, okay. Things. Yeah, that, that happens from time to time. Yeah. Uh, the big the fellow who used to be sort of the king of all that sort of thing was out on the West Coast. His name was uh, Peter Claudius in the early days of Multiplex. He mm -hmm. was the guy who explored that, I think, more than anyone. Yeah. There's even a snapshot of him with his so-called holoblow machine uh, in on my website. If you wander among the holoroids, okay. you'll see Peter standing there with his uh, hand on one of the knobs, so to speak. Okay. But they're knobs. They're doorknobs. Yes. Nothing that is perfectly, uh, perfectly clean. Yeah. Did you ever I, do any of the um, 360 uh, integrals? Oh, my God, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. oh what a wonderful format. Sure, yeah. absolutely. I think I produced the first cyclic one in which there was no beginning or end. Oh. And it was fun to explore that uh, back pre, you know, the digital domain. Uh, it was a portrait of a guy named Ram Das. Oh, okay, and, yeah. Uh, and so I filmed him uh, sitting on a cross-legged in my studio on this turntable, and as he rotated around to a frontal view, uh, we stopped the turntable, and I did a slow zoom into his eyes, and then, and then, uh, uh, then you notice this thing was appearing in the sort of third eye area, and his eyes faded out, and as his eyes faded out, this thing faded up and uh, you real and it was you realize it was spinning a circular mm -hmm. design this mandala pattern and it was spinning and you were zooming away from it and just by about the time that you had a full view of the full mandala spinning in the middle of the 360 this image of this guy sitting in full lotus position from seen from behind starts fading up from the center of the mandala mm -hmm. and then the mandala fades out and you're back to uh, him arcing around and looking you in the eye again. Mm. So it's a hologram that had no real beginning or end, and it was an interesting experiment I did with uh, Linwood Dunn, uh, did the optical out in Hollywood, and starting to apply Hollywood effects to uh, to holographic stereograms was kind of seemed like a no-brainer at the time. And, and so basically the tail of the A element of his portrait was faded and dissolved into the head of the B element, mm. which was uh, the mandala, mandala, and then at the tail of the B element, it was mm. faded and dissolved back in. So that's the way the, the into the A. So that's the way the, the film was prepared, and it basically, it's nothing. It's an ancient thing in Hollywood, but it was kind of due to holography yeah. to go through that kind of an optical handstand to produce the origination materials. And I'm trying to think of who printed that uh, hologram. If, if listeners want to see a sample of that, um, you have an animated GIF right on your main page of that. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. but that's you're yeah, looking it's just at several, six out of yeah. a thousand and eighty yes. frames. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good yeah, it's idea. much smoother when you're looking at a thousand and eighty frames. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you want to add to the interview, Mark? Um, well, nothing occurs to me right off the. the you know, it's just one of these things. I'm sure when I hang up, I'll say, "Oh man, I could have told him about that." Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess that we could talk just for a minute about about you know. When I first got into holography, I realized that some of the, the, the absolute best people making holograms technically were uh, totally uh, uh, unaware of what art made an art image mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and all that. So I kind of wanted to bridge that, that that right there, which seemed to be the challenge at the get-go, was to be able to technically execute these things that with with some aesthetic that was you know powerful as well as opposed to just like well here's a hologram of my uh, you know salt and pepper shaker or my forks or whatever yeah. and uh, and, all, and while it is very intriguing to see a three dimensional image of uh, of an object uh, that may not be present anymore or, you know in the holographic image that's very intriguing mm -hmm. there's more to be done with the medium than simply three dimensionally uh, capturing 
things that you can imagine in the first like, place. Yeah, I could call or it, even but... capture in other ways three-dimensionally. Yeah. And uh, there was a fellow by the name of M.C. Escher, who's a very mm -hmm. famous uh, artist. Uh, I'm sure you people in your audience have seen his work, from mm -hmm. his work. And in one of his books, he talks about uh, um, um, uh, approaches to infinity, is what he calls it. It's a little monograph. It's like a page and a half long in the beginning of one of those famous Escher books. And he calls, in, in Approaches to Infinity, he describes <clears throat> how... Uh, when he was originally schooled as a draftsman, his, his main task was trying to make that eye-brain-hand connection and, and convey that which his mind's eye could grasp onto paper. Hmm. And that was <laughs> what he had to learn at first. Well, once he got that down real well, um, uh, this sort of kind of bored him, and he started uh, imagining, thinking about, well, how can I convey things that the mind's eye can't grasp, mm -hmm. such as infinity? And this began like a 30, 40 year uh, um, effort in so many various works that I'm sure many of the viewers have seen, uh, 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 in which he tried to convey this concept of infinity. He says to himself, well, I need a piece of paper of infinite size, so that's not going to work. Hmm. Somehow in a small area, I'm going to have to evoke that feeling, and, and that became his pursuit. And, um, so I mentioned this in the context of holography only because um, uh, we all, like for instance, you have a hologram of some puppy dogs or a hologram of uh, you know a clown or whatever. We can all kind of imagine what a clown looks like in 3D or a puppy dog or whatever, uh, salt and pepper shakers. Um, it's the stuff that we can't imagine in 3D that I find so interesting uh, uh, to use holography as a medium for. That's why I personally I'm, I'm, I'm partial to abstracts. Mm -hmm. uh, abstract images just the beauty of the color and the light and the purity of the color uh, that one can do and the kinetics that you can apply I've, I've done quite a number of holograms like that but um, uh, it's actually my favorite stuff is, is the non-representational holograms where they're not necessarily representing a three-dimensional thing but the medium is just used as a fluid way to paint with light that moves Yes. and, uh, and then it would be impossible to do with any other medium yeah well. exactly Exactly. Yeah. Whereas a good stereogram of um, you know the puppy dogs or whatever, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so, so that's something that maybe people can be uh, uh, launched into. Some of your students or uh, pra early practitioners, what have you. Well, maybe mm -hmm. even the older practitioners. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I enjoy that aspect of holography that you can that you can approach uh, the visualization of things that cannot be um, imagined, and uh, is is. is I think more interesting. I've done a couple of holograms like that, and I think that that's that's cool stuff. You know, we're like big game fishing in the in the you know in the dark void of pure research. You know, mm. and, and stuff pops up. Yeah. When you're not in pursuit of uh, of applied science or, or art in particular, stuff stuff does show up. Dr. Gabor invented holography, discovered it, if you will, uh, by so-called accident. Mm -hmm. Some say in that he was really trying to improve two-dimensional imaging technology of the electron microscopy. Yes. So uh, he inadvertently or serendipitously discovered a three-dimensional imaging medium. So my contention is that what will a holographer en route one day en route to trying to improve holography, the three-dimensional imaging technology of holography, discover mm. by so-called accident or serendipitously. So it's that the hope of that next uh window into something that we've never seen before that may show up and this is why I said earlier uh, whether they're 15 or they're 60 years old it makes no difference I, my oldest student has been 72 years old and my youngest student mm. was 8 years old mm. and uh, I, I don't think that um, that age has anything to do with it uh, it's just a matter of paying real close attention yeah. maybe time travel will be the holography of the future mm. <laughs> who knows you know, well, I think people think direct. time travel and, and that it's so far fetched, but I'm sure holography is far fetched at one time as well. Just as far fetched. Well, you know, there's, there's a wacky, uh, wacky uh, directions that things are going in terms of projection technology. You know, uh, 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 direct right to retina, I think, is, mm -hmm. is, is has a big future. It already exists, of course, uh, where you pop on the glasses and the, the little diodes are writing writing the images on your retinas, but it appears as a giant three-dimensional image in space in front of you. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that already exists. Um, while it hasn't been made super popular, they're you know under defense contracts for those things. And I'm not sure you can actually run out and buy one, but they're, they're, they exist for some years now. We're, we're, you don't require a giant screen at all. The glasses are actually projecting, writing the image and rewriting it onto your retinas directly. Yeah. So I think other directions for, for this sort of thing, for, you know, 
may uh, it may evolve into something else. I don't know about the time travel part, Frank. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, it's a little far fetched. That's very ambitious. Yes. <laughs> Where can someone see your work? Do you have anything exhibited anywhere across the country right now? Well, yeah, there's some stuff. I know that I believe still in, like, for instance, in Canada, I think they still have a giant dizzy over at the uh, at the uh, Ontario Science Museum. Okay. And uh, uh, up until recently, there was some stuff. In, I, I don't really know where all the stuff is. Do you I have a gallery know. down in Florida? I have. I maintain a gallery down here now. Uh huh. And uh, well, tell the listeners about that because I'm sure there's some people in Florida. That are listening oh sure. Right well, now. if anyone can just go to the website, you know, diamondimages.com, and then yeah. and then give me a ring and say, hey, uh, I'd love to come over because it's not like open to the public in general. Okay. You know? It's open, but by appointment. Yeah. Um, I, I set up a first gallery of holograms south in New York here back in '75, I think it was, and ran that for about 12 years. And so that was pretty neat. Um, there was actually a place where you could come in and see the work of holographers from all over the world, really, as much as my own, um, for about 12 years and um, uh, maybe 100 holograms at any given time on display. Yeah. And that's always been fun and uh, still maintain a collection, but uh, and from time to time do, uh, you know, tra- uh, not a traveling show per se, but a show that can travel. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Well, you've certainly done a lot of work, and, and you're really... Uh out there as far as continuing with uh, projects all the time. Yeah, it's amazing so, you know, how some of these things, you know, you have to kind of stick uh, stick with your dreams because uh, some of them take a long time to come to fruition. Yeah. yeah. I guess you just have to find your place. I found my niche, I think, with the uh, amateurs and hobbyists and education end, which uh, I think some people uh, in the early days were uh, interested in the education, but I don't think there was a lot of interest in anybody being an amateur or hobbyist, but I saw that as an, an opportunity for a growth. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. I, I still insist, you know, I know I'm repeating myself, but, uh, but, but it, it's not necessarily from academics and from professional scientists that the developments come from. Mm-hmm. I mean, didn't, didn't the guys who developed Kodachrome, weren't they musicians, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, it's it's really uh, I expect um, the innovations to come from the outside as much as from the inside of the so-called scientific establishment. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and that's going to happen with an amateur uh, who is paying real close attention. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for taking this time to uh, talk. It's been a great interview, and I'm sure people appreciate you taking the time as well to uh, come on and talk about holography. There's not too many outlets out there, you know, where someone can, uh, you know, come on and uh, listen to somebody talk about something that they enjoy. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. And if I grab uh, one of the pictures of your holograms, would it be okay to put it on the holograms? Oh, sure. People steal stuff on my side all the time. Yeah, I know. All right. Well, Mark, thank you very much. I'll send, I'll send you an email when the show's getting ready to go up, okay? Yep.